This is the Spur Leadership Podcast. I'm Mac Richard, and we are here with Mike Ward, Executive Director of Spur Leadership. And what we wanted to do was just kind of pull out some of the conversation that we had with Jesse James that we yeah. posted in our last podcast because I was surprised by a lot of the leadership nuggets that came out of that. I think a lot of times when yeah. you think of Jesse James, you think pop culture, you think The Apprentice, you think you know headlines and all that kind of stuff. But the guy is a really solid businessman. Yeah, very impressive individual, right? He's had some challenges in life, which he told us some of those stories. Which some of was, which were self-inflicted. Yeah, exactly, and very kind of him to tell us, but didn't hold him back, right? And he's created a few companies yeah, that are no out there doubt. today being very successful. So it was very impressive. I think one of the things that, that I was really struck by was how – firmly committed he is to the vision that he's always had even when he was figuring out the vision you know when he talked about starting out in his garage stamping out rear fenders for custom wheels on Harley Davidson's yeah. he knew what he was trying to do and wasn't going to waver from that and i think that's one of the things when you because i think there are a lot of people out there that probably are never going to be Jesse James in terms of fame. Yeah. But when you run your own organization, if you are an entrepreneur, which you've got some experience in that in your previous life yeah. before Spur Leadership, when you are starting an organization to have an understanding of who you are and what you stand for, I think is really important. And one of the things that I didn't know, when we started Lake Hills Church in 1997, we had a vision but we did not articulate mm. our culture. Mm. We didn't articulate the values that would define the culture. We tried to live by them, and there were certain things yeah. that you knew not to do and you knew that you needed to do. But I, th I thought that Jesse was so clear in who he was trying to be and who he was not going to be yeah. from the very beginning. That was one of the things that struck me. I think watching – we walked into his, his shop there, right, on his property here in, in Texas, and he was living out – what he loves, his passion, what he's very good at. And so to know what we know and had not been on the journey with him over the last you know, number of years starting these companies, he's done what he's very good at and what he loves to do and built a business around that. Right. And you find very few people have, have necessarily done it that way. Yeah, they had a great idea, they had a great concept and had the vision to do something. That doesn't mean they're doing what they truly love. He has taken what he loves to do, right, work with metal, and, and made multiple companies with that. Right. And the ability then to create that culture around the fact that you're doing day in and day out, which we watched him do that day, is just, you know, play and mold and, and shape metal into – pieces that I could never imagine doing with my hands. Well, he said that, remember when we had him at the at the Spur Leadership Conference in April to introduce the fact that he was coming on the podcast, one of the things that he said was, he said, listen, I do things that nobody needs. Yeah. He goes, you don't need a $100,000 pistol. <laughs> yeah. and I thought, like, that's a fair point. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, he is selling as many of those as he can make yeah. because he's committed to his craft. Yeah. And, and I think, again... Not only did he does he live by a code and he and he runs his companies by a code and his people love working for him yeah. for him. He's also very aware of of who he is and who he's not. Yeah. And so he's really really committed to the craft. The day that we were in his shop, he was forging Damascus steel which you have to do over and over and over again by by forging layers of steel together and then hammering them yeah. down, and then forging more layers onto it. But it's a craft to be able to do that, that he's gotten really, really serious about honing his craft. Yeah. And I think for anybody in any arena, that's one of the things with, with our kids being the age that they mm -hmm. are right out of college, I've tried to communicate to them that your 20s is a great opportunity to get great at something. Yeah. But the only way you're going to get great at something is if you dig in and work intentionally on the craft of whatever it is that you're doing. And I believe not being around his shops or his different companies on a day-to-day -day basis that what we saw that day was Jesse every day. Yeah. And so you love he it. He doesn't change a lot for whoever comes yeah, in. Exactly, right? I think he even wore, you know, his work clothes when he was on stage here for the Spur conference. And which is great. You know, he is who he is. Yep. And, and that's that's a great thing. 
I assume his staff see the fact that he rolls up his sleeves and is doing the grunt work yeah. alongside them. And he hasn't stopped doing that. He hasn't sat there and said, oh, this is mine now, or I'm you know, at this level. You guys now do this well, work. Well, that was one of the things he talked about was that, you know, he just turned 50 years old. Orange County Choppers is 30 years old yeah. this year as we, you know, record this in 2019. But the fact that he is so serious about his craft, I think, earns him credibility yeah. with the people who work for him and with him every day. So that when he walks around to check, the, and, and what's fascinating, if you list the prop, the the companies, you've got Jesse James Firearms, you've got yeah. Jesse James, you know, uh, West Coast Choppers, you've got Jesse James Culinary that is yeah. making kitchen <laughs> knives and cleavers yeah. like they've never been made before, and and he's still doing motorcycles, he's, he's still doing ammo, cars, he's company, got ammunition. Yeah. So when he when he goes around his shop there in Dripping Springs, Texas, and talks to them about the work that they're doing, they know that he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, exactly, right? There is no one that probably knows how that machine works or how that should be done better than he does, which is great. And th those are the, the two or three things that came out outside of, you know, that was first time meeting him, outside of him being just a really nice guy, uh, was the fact that he rolls up his sleeves, yeah. right? He is, he loves what he does and he hasn't changed who he is, right? Right. Exactly how I saw him on TV, you know, West Coast Choppers, Prince, whatever it may be, where, where you, you knew of Jesse, to meeting Jesse, it was the same person. Yeah, yeah. And to me, that uh, you wish a lot more people were like, right? Well, a lot I of think, too, one of the things he talked about was when he got away from that was when he got sideways. Yeah. And, and you know, all of his well-chronicled public mistakes, failings, whatever you want to yeah. call them, he, he got away from who he was, and that cost him a lot. Yeah. It cost him a lot personally. It cost him a lot relationally. Um, and so – and he lost a lot of sponsorships and a lot yeah. of things, you know, TV shows and everything else. But he came back to that. And I think it's interesting – I think it was interesting that, you know, here's a California kid mm. who decided, you know what, I'm leaving California, I'm leaving Hollywood, yeah. I'm leaving all that stuff, and I'm moving – literally out to the country outside of Austin in Dripping Springs, Texas, yeah. and I'm going to just do what I do. And I thought, Mike, about where you come from, from the business perspective, you know, coming out of college and, yeah. and going into the business world and the marketplace, your 20s were a time when you honed your craft. Yeah. You know, where you got, I did it in ministry yeah. and, and wish I, looking back on it, I wish I'd have been a lot more intentional mm -hmm. about it. But Talk a little bit about your experience of, of using that time in your 20s and early 30s to really dig in and hone your craft. Yeah, I think I did it for two reasons. One, I always grew up, it was, you know, I was going to be an NHL player growing up in Canada. That's, you know, sure. what you needed to do, right, right as, a, as a guy growing up in Canada. I always wanted to be a business person. Really? And there was just, you know, nothing specific about it uh, to say I was in that industry versus the other industry. But I always wanted to be a business person. You know, my, my father grew up. He's a salesman. Uh, my grandfather before him, you know, the blue collar type employee, you know, very satisfied with what they do. But they want to go and be successful on a day to day basis to provide. And so doing hockey probably around my teens mid teens was not going to be my career <laughs> uh to coming out of university going i always had the passion to do it i also had a little bit of fire under me because i had a lot of school debt that i needed to pay yeah. off right and so you went i started my career in 2007 february 1st 2007 okay i got my job in toronto canada and i was a foreign exchange trader <clears throat> And so honing the craft was, again, pressured by debt, but pressured by, I think it was six months or 12 months, the compensation went away and your straight commission. Wow. So eat yeah. what you kill That's a mentality, motivator. right? Yeah. And so for me, I went, I don't know a lot uh, compared to the people around me. I'm going to be a sponge. Yeah. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to watch what people are doing and maybe shouldn't be doing and just try to learn from everyone around me to sit there and hone my craft and yep. improve my craft. Okay, I want to ask you a question because you just said something that resonated with me. When we moved to Austin, I was 30, but a young 30. 
and we were starting the church, and there were 15 people that said, we are Lake Hills Church. <laughs> 15 great people, yeah. but 15 people is not long-term sustainable. So I understand the fear. I didn't necessarily have the college debt and, and that thing that you yeah. were talking about, but I think a lot of times we talk about fear as a negative thing yeah. when it can be it can be a really positive thing ba depending upon how you view the fear. Yeah. Now, it can paralyze you and, and cause you to just freeze up. But what, what it did for me, now there were a couple of times when I froze up. Yeah. I don't know if you, if you ever experienced that or you went through it. Still going through it, yeah. <laughs> but by and large, it was a motivator for me to go, okay, this has to work. Yeah. And it has to be sustainable, self-sustaining over time. We had so many people. Our church, uh, where we came from in Dallas, Fellowship Church with Pastor Ed and Lisa Young, they helped us get started and were incredibly, incredibly gracious. But that's not a long-term plan. Yeah. You have to figure out self-sustainability. Yeah. And when I say self-sustainability, I don't mean I'm not ignoring the the factor that is God providing everything. I, I obviously agree with that and believe in that wholeheartedly. I saw it happen too many times. But I'm talking about just from a straight operational, functional perspective as a family, as an individual, as an organization, a business, or whatever, Jesse James' interest and in, mm -hmm. in whatever, self-sustaining, it has to be able to be something that adds enough value to other people yeah. that they will pay or contribute to keep it going. Yeah. So did you have a point, with, take Lake Hills as an example, where you go, this is our passion. Mm -hmm. This is what we want to do. Potentially that fear of the unknown of, is it going to work? Right. And it, it is now sustainable. Where, where was that point in time that you would go, this is now no longer Viable. a dream. It yeah. is now, oh, this is sustainable. Yeah. Where did yeah. that trigger for you? That's a great question. It was probably in about year three, yeah, maybe even four, where my wife Julie and I could kind of step back and go, yeah. okay, I know, like I, I, I knew that we always had enough resources, whether it be people or financial resources, I knew that we always had enough resources to have church next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's not that's where the fear came from. Yeah. I think it was probably year three or four when I when I felt like as I looked at the scope of, of Lake Hills Church and who was coming and where we were in terms of people, in terms of um, financial resources, that I knew we would have church next month. Mm. And then I felt like there were enough people there, unless I did something really stupid, they weren't all going to go away, so we would probably be here the next year. That was probably year three or four yeah. of of just very, very steady, but it was incremental growth. We never hit a hockey stick graph chart where you would kind of go, oh, this thing is just catching fire. We had, we had some great years, and we saw great things happen, but it was never just exponential. It was very, very much incremental growth in people, in resources, in, in the ministries that we were then able to offer because of the resources and the people. But like I said, it was it was probably year three or so before I felt like, okay, this is going. Back, this breath, is actually yeah. a, um, what do they call it, a going concern. Yeah. You know what I mean? I feel like that's a key takeaway because having been an entrepreneur or having been involved with entrepreneurs or people that are just wanting to be successful, get to the next stage, whatever that measurement is, people think it needs to happen overnight. Right. Right. And for you to describe three to four years, I wasn't going to expect that it would have been that long, but it, it takes time. Now, right? let me say this too. We might have been a little viable before then. That's when I felt like we were viable. Yeah. <laughs> and so sometimes your feelings can be misleading. And that's a key part of it though, But right? it is yeah. a key because how you feel and and how you respond in individual situations determines what's going to happen. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I and I think I think that's another thing that's important. And Jesse talked a little bit about this: is how you how you lead your business, how you lead your church or your organization or your family in different ways at different seasons. Yeah. 
you know, um, we're a we are exactly the same in terms of our vision, in terms of our values today as we were 22 years ago when there were 15 of us. Yeah. And my wife, Julie, was running the nursery and preschool ministry on Sunday morning, and the nursery and preschool ministry on Sunday morning consisted of our two kids. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. So, But we're the same. They're just more of us. There's more yeah. of it around us. And, and so I have to lead differently now than I did even three years ago, even though our staff is not necessarily the same size now that it was three years ago. I've got to lead differently because we've got a different set of experiences. Mm. We got a, there's there's different historical water under the bridge yeah. that's going to impact everything that we do, yeah. and so you've got to learn how to shift on the fly. And we didn't talk about this, I don't think, in too much detail with Jesse, but his vision. I mean, multiple companies, multiple focuses, and in, in somewhat different industries that they're in, even though they all come from metal. But the idea of his vision it seemed like it has stayed consistent yeah. throughout. You know, his culture, his you know, morals, his values have stayed consistent throughout. I think in leadership, y- you always talk about mission, vision, values. Um, I've been in many companies that want to have those debates and discussions almost every year. Yeah. Is it new this year? How do we change it? What do we reward? But Jesse, you just talking about Lake Hills as an example, just keep it consistent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Strategy may change. And absolutely. Right. And deliverables or you know how we execute may change. Resources changes, whatever that may be. But the vision doesn't need to change if you have the right vision. Well, to that point, you know, the the environment that we operate in as a church has changed dramatically yeah. since 1997. You know, for for one, we've changed in that we're not in an elementary school cafetorium anymore <laughs> for our worship services. We've changed in that there are a lot more of us. We have more people on staff than we had in our church. Yeah. So we've changed in those ways, but not at our core, at what drives us. And I think going back to something that Carly Fiorina said at the conference in April, she said a lot of companies fall back on the crutch of reorganizing mm-hmm. or rebranding. And I've never heard anybody say that before, but when she said that, Mike, it struck such a resonant chord with me because I was thinking, how many, how many businesses, how many churches have changed the name of the church yeah. when really what they needed to do was change the behavior yeah. and, and change, when I say change the behavior, I mean you, you need to drill down into what works and what is right rather than rebranding and getting a new logo yeah. or a new website. Yeah. to change the thought comes to my head here is is just putting a different color lipstick on the pig it, you know well said. you actually need to go to the foundation yeah as well said. yeah thank you. you need to retrain right? the pig yeah exactly you need to go to the core where the opportunities are where the where the situations are so leadership if we take lake hills as an example or jesse or you know my past we grow we develop enterprises get bigger and so take you as the head pastor at lake hills where you're at the top now you have to be as you were, the dreamer, the vision, but at times be the person that's rolling up their sleeves. Absolutely. Getting into the, the grunt work, getting into yep. the details. How's that balance um, work for you? Or, or where, where and when do you need to do that to show that, hey, I'm one of you yeah. on staff, volunteer, whatever it may be, but I'm also the person that needs to step back. Because that's ultimately the responsibility that I have. And, and it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because over the last... I'm going to tell you the last year in the life of our church, I have been managing some staff transitions that we've had, all of which have been have ended up being really good. And I've been down in the weeds a lot more than I like to be yeah. and a lot more, I think, than my gifts really dictate. But that's where I needed to be. And when I say down in the weeds, I mean spending time with individual people on staff and and as they've maybe as they've left the staff or as they've come to the staff or as those who have remained process through all those Mm -hmm. changes, it's taken a lot more time of just sitting down and and checking in with people going, Hey, how are you doing? Yeah. That's not my strength. That's not, I really do care about people, but I have to, I have to force myself to Mm -hmm. be aware. I need to make sure that I'm checking in with folks and not just people on staff, key members of our church. Yeah. Because, 
a lot of times when people leave a company or an organization in the marketplace, I think people expect that. They, they know that that's going to happen. Yeah. In church world, a lot of times people are like, what? They, they're, they're leaving? And, um, and the thing that you've got to remember is people are people. And so I've spent a good bit of time with members of our church kind of going, hey, I just want you to know everything's great. And we, those who have left, we wish them nothing but the best, and we're grateful for their time here. And we've still got work to do. We're, yeah. we're moving forward and continuing to move the ball forward, and everything's fine. That takes more time and energy in an area that is not my favorite place to spend time and energy. Yeah. But it was what was needed. I found one experience in my career, uh, which I've had multiple experiences that I needed to you know, correct what I was doing or, or do something different and better. I did three companies in the exact same industry doing exact same service and product, you know, foreign exchange, international payments. And I started from the bottom and worked, you know, myself up into different positions. And so when I moved from different companies, I'd go in and go, I know that job. I know yeah. that bottom job. But processes may have been a little bit different. Technology may have been a little bit different. And so as I sat there and assumed, you know, kind of in, in my seat, that I knew what those people were dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis or going through, I actually didn't as well as I thought. Yes, I did it, and I did it, you know, multiple years ago, but it was pushed on me to go, hey, go sit in their seat. Yeah. Go, you know, ask them to step aside, and not just for half an hour, an hour, go spend time. And so I remember this was probably, it was leading up to Brexit. That Brexit vote was June, maybe three or four years ago right. now. And I took one of you know, the positions that were an entry level position at the company, and I did the job for a full week. You know, that was, uh, <laughs> you know, but I lived out what they dealt with on yeah. a day to day basis so that I actually better understood the opportunities, better understood the feedback that we were getting of, yep. hey, this technology isn't as great as you think it is. Here's right. how I actually do things, and, and actually participated in. And so even when you started the church, and like you said, you and Julie were, probably in doing some of the, the volunteer positions that now you, we have a full resource and group doing for you. Right. They may be dealing with things a little bit differently than sure. you did 20 plus years well, ago. Well, if for no other reason, the scale's different. Yeah. You know, and, and that changes things. Scale, it's not just that you do the same things, you know, at a bigger scale. Scale changes things. And so your processes have to change. Your systems have to change. And, and again, I will tell you freely, not, not gladly, but freely, mm -hmm. systems and processes is not a gift of mine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that's not where I'm strongest, but I know that. And so I've, I've taken great pains. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you who's really great at it is my wife. Yes, she's my wife. She could run a large country if she wanted to. <laughs> she doesn't care to, but yeah. she could. I don't mean she could run a small country. She could run a large country. She's got incredible... Um, she has an incredible skill at breaking things down and being able to communicate it to help other people understand and be able to process it and then do it. And uh, she's somebody that I, I lean on heavily as we scale up and as we grow to, to change those systems and that kind of thing. So I think all of these things kind of point to the fact, you know, and, and going back to Jesse James for just a second, because I think... I think what we saw in Jesse's shop and in the conversation that we had with him was the fact that if you do it well, it will grow. Yeah. But you have to adjust to facilitate the growth. Yeah. You have to adjust the, the size and the scope of how many people you are willing to bring on, how many people you're willing to be responsible for, and how you handle your job day in and day out. Because Jesse, he loves forging. You know, what we saw him doing in the shop that day, he loves that work. But he knows too that he, because he's responsible for the whole organization, he has to shut down the forge every now and then and go back over to the other shop yeah. and, and check in and see how people are doing on the jobs that they've agreed to do. And, and ultimately, I think being able to manage those complexities of, your own bandwidth, your own time and resources to lead, manage, serve the people that you're responsible for may be the most important leadership skill there is. And I loved hearing the story that he created the business on the side 
of actually having a full time job. I think he was working at a different shop and wasn't even doing fenders, right? Joining the, right. the two pieces he, as he described together and making it unique. And he started having sales that were so great that he couldn't do both. Yeah. So this guy's working day and night to perfect his craft. Probably wasn't sitting there saying, well, I want to make X dollars or sell X number right. of things. He just said, I need to make this as good as possible that people really want it. Yep. And I love doing it. And then all of a sudden took off. And yeah. I think he was describing to support your comments there, growth and management of growth. I think they went and got, it was 10,000 square feet in Long Beach. And yeah. then they eventually had six blocks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's well, he walked into the 10,000s and said, there's no way we'll ever use all this space. Yeah. Okay, correct. And then right? it became a fraction of what he really needed. I incredible. Right. Again, I think a lot of people want to shoot for the stars, um, dream big, which I love that. But they lose focus on the foundation of, of the key pieces that you need to do from the leadership. Well, and you just I think you just hit maybe the most important piece because it's one thing to hone your craft. It's another one to, you know, adjust your systems and processes yeah. as you grow. You can't do any of those things without a monster work ethic. Yeah. Jesse, whatever you want to say, and I love the guy, whatever you want to say about him, he will work his head off. Yeah. And that may be the most important lesson from our 20s yeah. is to be willing to roll up your sleeves, dig in, and see everything as a learning opportunity that then in your 30s you yeah. can kind of filter and hopefully begin to not just hone your craft, but you can kind of narrow a little bit the scope of and narrow the scope of what you do into those things that you're really gifted and talented and passionate about. One of the things that drives me crazy, and this may be a great place to wrap this conversation up, is when people tell young people, follow your passion. Mm. No. Yeah. Yes, you should you should what they're really saying is don't do something that you're not passionate about, I think is more helpful. Yeah. But whatever but work hard. Yeah. If you work hard, you will find something you're passionate about. Yeah. You will. It's. I think a lot of times it's more. A pro, it's more like dating. I think dating is more a process of elimination than it is yeah. finding the one. So work really hard. Figure out something that you're willing to do for 50, 60 hours a week, right out of school, and then just go do it. I, I think it's big. In and I know that we wanted to wrap up, but when I was February first in that two thousand seven year, I was hired with eight other people. I believe it was. Okay. Founder run business, and the founder said there'll be probably two of you that make it. And in a sales role, it's it's dial for dollars. It's you know, sure. Um, it was all phone based activity that we needed to do. And he said, if you you know want to take some of the practices that have worked for other salespeople, you put a jar with a hundred pins in it, and you have a second jar. And every time you make a phone call, you move that pin over. And I remember going home that first week and going, there's eight of us with the hundred pins on the desk. I went and bought another 50 pins. <laughs> and so I had 150 pins. I'm going, if there's one thing that I can do, I may not be a better salesperson. I hope I was. Right. I'll just out dial them. Right. And the odds should be with me. I may not out talent anybody else, but I, will, I can outwork them. Exactly. And I think, you know, we saw that in Jesse. He yeah. goes, that guy probably still outworks most of his staff. Yeah. Does he need to? No. No. But he does. Right. And, you know, those key basics, I think so many people forget about. Yeah. It's a great, great point. Mike, thank you, man. Enjoyed thank you. it thoroughly. That was good. Thank you for checking out the Spur Leadership Podcast with Mac Richard. Be sure and subscribe. And while you're at it, leave us a review or a comment. You can reach us by email at podcast at spurleadership.com. And you can also find us on Twitter at Spur Leadership or on Facebook at Spur Leadership. 